please don't do this because I really think that that's why I, I, I hope you Jordan agree with it that why we are here engaged in this debate don't take it as a cheap competition. It may be that, but we are, as you said in your introduction, desperately trying to confront serious problems. I mean, for example, when I mentioned China, China, I didn't mean to celebrate it. That worries me terribly. My God, is this our future? No. no. Sorry, sorry for this. Sorry, please. The discount take away this from my 10 minutes. No, no, problem. <laughs> no problem, no problem. Dr. Peterson, 10 minutes to you to reply. So I like to speak extemporaneously, but Dr. Zizek's um, discussion was so complex that there's no way that I can juggle my responses spontaneously. So. Okay, <laughs> yeah, well, and, 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 and <laughs> achievement managed, I would say. Um, so, so I heard much of, I heard, much of what I heard, I agreed with, um, but we can get to that. Um, I'm going to respond. Keep that. Put out the knife. All right. <laughs> well, I, I, I heard a criticism of capitalism, but no real support of Marxism. And, and that's an interesting thing, because for me, the, the terms of the argument were... Well, there were three terms of the argument, let's say. There was capitalism, there was Marxism, and there was happiness. And I would say Dr. Zizek focused probably more on the problems of capitalism and the problems of happiness than on the utility of Marxism. And that actually comes as a surprise to me, because I presume that much of what I would hear would be a support of something approximating traditional or even a traditional Marxism, which is why I organized the first part of my talk as an attack against Marxism per se. Okay, so now Zizek points out that there are problems of capitalism. And I would like to say that I'm perfectly aware that there are problems with capitalism. Um, I wasn't defending capitalism, actually, in some sense. I was defending it in comparison to communism, which is not the same thing. Because as Winston Churchill said about democracy, you know, it's the worst form of government there is, except for all the other forms. And so, you might say the same thing about capitalism, is that it's the worst form of economic arrangement you could possibly manage, except for every other one that we've ever tried. And, and, that, and I'm dead serious about that. I'm not trying to be flippant. I mean that it isn't obvious to me, when, when Dr. Zizek is speaking in more apocalyptic terms, it isn't obvious to me that we can solve the problems that confront us. You know, and it, it's not also not a message that I have been purveying that unbridled capitalism per se, as an isolated, what would you say, social economic structure, actually constitutes the proper answer to the problems that confront us. So I haven't made that case in any of the lectures that I've, anything I've written or any of the lectures that I've done, because I don't believe it to be true. He, he said, well, what's the problems with capitalism? Well, the commodification of cultural life, all life. Fair enough. Um, there, there's something that isn't exactly right about reducing everything to economic competition. And capitalism certainly pushes in that direction. Advertising culture pushes in that direction. Sales and marketing culture pushes in that direction. And there's reasons for that. And I have a certain amount of admiration for the necessity of advertisers and salesmen and marketers. But that doesn't mean that the transformation of all elements of life into, element, into commodities in a capitalist sense is the best way forward. I, I don't think it is the best way forward. Um, I, I think the evidence for that is actually quite clear. There is, by the way, a relationship. This is something I didn't point out before. There is a relationship between wealth and happiness. It's quite well de defined in the psychological literature. Now, it's not exactly obvious whether the happiness measures are measures of happiness or whether they're measures of the absence of misery. And my sense is, as a psychometrician who's looked at these scales, that people are more concerned with not being miserable than they are with being happy. And those are all actually separate uh, emotional states mediated by different psychobiological systems. But it's a technical point, but it's an important one. The, there is a relationship between absolute level of income and self-reported lack of misery or happiness. And it's pretty linear until you hit, I would say, something approximating decent working class income. 
And so what seems to happen is that wealth makes you happy as long as it keeps the bill collectors at bay. Like once you've got to the point where the misery is staved off as much as it can be by the fact that you're not absolutely in you're not in absolutely economically dire straits, then adding more money to your life has no relationship whatsoever to your well-being. And so it's clear that past a certain minimal point, additional material provision is not sufficient to, let's say, redeem us individually or socially. And it's certainly the case that the radical wealth production that characterizes capitalism might produce a fatal threat to the structure of our social systems and our broader ecosystems. Who knows? I'm not absolutely convinced of that for a variety of reasons. I mean, Zizek pointed out, for example, that there are more forests in Europe in now than there were 100 years ago. There's actually more forests in the entire northern hemisphere than there were 100 years ago. And the news on the ecological front is not as dismal as the people who put out the most dismal news would have you think. And there is some possibility. That doesn't mean that there aren't elements of it that are dismal. You know, what we've done to the oceans is definitely something catastrophic, and we, we definitely have our problems. But it is possible that human ingenuity might solve that. Um, what else? There are inequalities generated by capitalism, a proclivity towards a shallow materialism, the probability of corruption. Um, the thing about that for me is those are catastrophes that are part of the struggle for human existence itself and not something to be laid at the feet of any given socio-political system, especially one that seems to be producing a fair modicum of wealth for the poorest section of the population and raising people up to the point where, you know, they, their lives aren't unending, an unending day-to-day -day struggle for mere survival. There's some evidence, for example, that if you can get GDP up to about $5,000 per person per year, oh, that's GDP, um, that people start to become concerned about environmental degradation and start to take actions to prevent it. And so there is some possibility that if we're lucky, we can get the bottom billion or two billion people in the world, or three billion as the population grows, up to the point where they're wealthy enough so they actually start to care enough about the environment so that we could act collectively to solve environmental problems. Now you might say, oh, by that time we'll be out of Earth. You know, we'll have, we'll have exhausted the resources that are in front of us so desperately that there's no hope of that. But I would like to remind you of a famous bet between Julian Simon and um, the biologist at, at Stanford who wrote, Paul Ehrlich, who wrote The Population Bomb. They bet, Ehrlich, who, who thought we were going to be overpopulated by the year 2000, bet Simon that by the year 2000, commodity prices would have increased dramatically as a consequence of evidence that we were running out of material resources. They made a famous bet over a 25-year period, and Ehrlich paid off Simon in the year 2000 because commodity prices went down and not up. And so there is no solid evidence that the fact that our population is growing and will peak out, by the way, at about 9 billion, there's no solid indication that the consequence of that is that we are, in fact, running out of necessary material resources. And so it's a danger, but it, there's, it's not a danger that's proven. And there is some utility in considering that the addition of several billion more brains to the planet, especially if they were well-nourished brains, as they increasingly are, might help us generate enough problem solvers so that we can stay ahead of the looming ecological catastrophe as our population balloons outwards. Now, we're going to peak at 9 billion. It's not much higher than we are now, and it looks like we might be able to manage it. Um, the, the other thing is that I didn't hear an alternative, really, from Dr. Zizek. You know, he, he admitted that the rise to success of the Chinese was in part a consequence of the, of the allowance of market forces and decried the authoritarian tendencies, and fair enough, that's exactly it. It also seemed to me that the social justice group identity processes that Dr. Zizek was decrying are, to me, a logical derivation from the oppression narrative that's a fundamental presupposition of Marxism. So there, I never heard a defense of Marxism in that part of his argument as well. And so for me, again, it's to ask what's the alternative. Um, I also heard an argument for egalitarianism, and, but I heard it defined as equality of opportunity, not as equality of outcome, which I see as a clearly defined Marxist aim. 
I heard an argument for a modified social distribution of wealth, but that's already part and parcel of most modern free market states with a wide variation and an appropriate variation of government intervention, all of which constitute their own experiment. We don't know how much social intervention is necessary to flatten the tendency of hierarchies to become tilted so terribly that only the people at the top have everything and all of the people at the bottom have nothing. It's a very difficult battle to fight against that profound tendency, much deeper than the tendency of capitalism itself, and we don't exactly know what to do about it. So we run experiments, and that seems to be working perfectly reasonably, as far as I can tell. Um, let's see. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll close with this. Capitalism in the free market well, that's the worst form of social organization possible, as I said, except for all the others. There is a positive relationship between economics measured by income and happiness or psychological well-being, which might be the absence of misery. I certainly do not believe, and the evidence does not suggest, that material security is sufficient. I do believe, however, that insofar as there is a relationship between happiness and material security, that the free market system has demonstrated itself as the most efficient manner to achieve that, and that was actually the terms of the argument. So thus, if it's capitalism versus Marxism with regards to human happiness, it's still the case that the free market constitutes the clear winner. And maybe capitalism will not solve our problems. I actually don't believe that it will. I have, in fact, argued that the proper pathway forward is one of individual moral responsibility aimed at the highest good. It's something for me that's rooted in our underlying Judeo-Christian tradition that insists that each person is, a, uh, what is, is sovereign in their own right and a locus of, 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 of ultimate value, which is something that you can accept regardless of your religious presuppositions and something that you do accept if you participate in a society such as ours. Even the fact that you vote, that you're charged with that responsibility is an indication that our society is structured such that we presume that each person is a locus of responsibility and decision-making of such import that the very stability of the state depends upon the integrity of their um, Psych the, in the integrity of their character. And so what I've been suggesting to people is that they adopt as much responsibility as they possibly can in keeping with that, in keeping with their aim at the highest possible good, which to me is something approximating a balance between what's good for you as an individual and what's good for your family in keeping with what's good for you as an individual and then what's good for society in the larger frame such that it's also good for you and your family. And that's a form of an well, an elaborated, iterated game, a form of elaborated cooperation. It's a sophisticated way of looking at the ways society could possibly be organized, and I happen to believe that that has to happen at the individual level first, and that's the pathway forward that I see. And so that's my 10-minute commentary. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I go up again. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Dr. Dr. Gizek. I already spent a little bit of my time. I will try to be uh, as short as possible. So a couple of remarks and then my final point. Why I think this self-limitation of capitalism is needed. First, about happiness. Just a couple of remarks. Uh, Jordan, I want to ask you, but isn't it, I, am I dreaming? I think I'm not. I remember a couple of years ago, it was reported all around the world, some kind of a, a, a investigation, percentage of people interviewed in different countries, do they feel happy with their life? And the shock was that some Scandinavian countries, which we, which we considered social democratic paradise, were very low, while Bangladesh, I think, was close to the top. Now, I know this logic has a limit. I don't buy the bullshit of poor people are happy in their world there and so on. But, you know, my argument here is not against you. My argument here is problematizing uh, happiness even more. Look, this may interest you. I was years ago in, uh, in I think, Lithuania, and we debated... I report on this in one of my books, when were people in some perverted sense, and this is the critique of the category of happiness for me, happy. And we came to the crazy result. After the Soviet intervention, Czechoslovakia 
in 1970s and 80s. Why? For happiness, first, you don't have, you should not have too much democracy, because this brings the burden of responsibility. Happiness means there is another guy out there, you can put all the blame on him. And as the joke went in Czechoslovakia, if there is bad weather, a storm, oh, this communist screwed it up again. That's one condition of happiness. The other condition, much more subtle one, is, and this was done in Czechoslovakia, those dark times after so the, the life was relatively moderately good, but not perfect. Like, there was meat all the time, maybe once a month there was not meat in the stores. It was very good to remind you how happy you are <laughs> the other time. Another thing, they had a paradise which should be at a proper distance, West Germany, affluence. It was not too far, but not directly accessible. You know, so I, I, it was, so maybe in your critique of communist regimes, I agree with you, you should more focus on something that I experience of, you know, don't look only at the terror, ultimately totalitarian regime. There was a kind of a silent, perverted pact between, at least in this late, a little bit more tolerant, but I still oppose them, communist regimes between power and population. The message was, leave us the power, don't mess it with us, and we guarantee you a relatively safe life, employment, private pleasures, private niche, and so on and so on. So I am not surprised, but again, this is not for me the argument for the communists, but against happiness, that, you know, people said when, uh, when the wall fell down, what a wonder in Poland. My God, in, in, uh, in uh, like, Solidarność, which was prohibited a year ago, now triumph at the elections. Who could imagine this? Yes, but the true miracle, in a bad sense for me, was four years later, democratically ex-communists came back to power. So, you know, don't, again, this is for me not the argument for them, but simply for the, let's call it corruptive, nature of happiness. So my formula, maybe you would agree with it, is my basic dogma is happiness should be treated as a necessary byproduct. If you focus on it, you are lost. It comes as a by byproduct of you working for a cause and so on. That's the basic thing for me. Second point, maybe we disagree here. China, of course, the miracle, economic miracle was due to unleashing uh, uh, market reform and so on. But, and here comes my pessimism. Some of my liberal friends are telling me, yes, imagine what would they have achieved with also political democratization. I'm a pessimist here. No. They found a perfect formula of how, and that's the paradox of China today. The Communist Party is the best manager of capitalism and protector against workers. The truly dangerous thing in China today is not to flirt with Western ideas, is to organize trade unions, to, you know, like, uh, this is what worries me. This perfect combination between unleashing capitalism and uh, still the authoritarian rule, or to put it in another way, my worry is that today, all around the world, this eternal marriage between capitalism and democracy is slowly disappearing. Till now, I admit it, uh, capitalism needed from time to time some 10, 20 years of dictatorship. When things started to improve, democracy returned. Chile, South Korea, and so on. I wonder if we are still at that. Now, at just uh, very quickly, uh, your basic point in, the introduc in your introduction. You know, I almost am tempted to say the way you presented Communist Manifesto, the simplified image, and so on and so on, it's crazy to say, but on many points I, I agree with you, and it's a very complex argument. Marx didn't have, for example, a good theory of how social power exists. His idea was simply with disappearance of class structure. Uh, it's secretly, although he wouldn't have accepted it, a technocratic dream. Like, by experts, social life will be run as a uh, perfect machine. Although he was at least aware 
of the problem, which is why he was so enthusiastic, Marx, about Paris Commune, you know, which was precisely not centralized power. So I'm not just defending Marx. I'm saying it was not clear to him. And uh, 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 so let's drop that. Maybe I have more interesting things uh, to say. Ah, another point. Uh, nonetheless, uh, where, uh, where w at one point I'm ready to claim, where did you find this? This goes maybe for today's politically correct jerks and so on, that this uh, egalitarianism. There is one passage in his late critique of Gotha program where Marx directly accesses the problem of equality. And he dismisses it as a strict bourgeois category. Explicitly, explicitly. For him, communism is not egalitarianism. It's, yes, hierarchy is but not based on capitalism. Okay. I'm not def totally defending here Marx. I'm just saying, uh, uh, don't refer this to Marx. OK, but to conclude, because yes, I want to keep my promise to be a little bit shorter. You know, I agree with you on many points. But you know what's my problem with uh, 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 my problem that I was aiming at? With all the openings, I know we don't know really what is happening with ecology and so on. Uh, or, uh, who, and this is an, okay, let's take oceans. You mentioned them. But isn't it for me, correct me if I'm wrong, and I don't mean this rhetorically, maybe I'm really wrong, but the problem of oceans, can, the only way for me is some kind of cooperated international action and so on. You cannot simply leave it to the market. That's what I'm saying. This is the faithful limit that I see. About this diminishing poverty and so on, I am aware of it. I tend to agree with it. I also, but I, at the same time, see so many explosive tensions. For example, do you know about South Africa? It's a terrifying situation on the edge of the civil war. To be very brutal, the only thing that I'm simplifying it, that really happened with end of apartheid, is that uh, the old ruling class, I simplify it in grotesque Marxist term, was joined by a new black ruling class, which is not doing a good job, so they are trying to play the race card. It's still the consequence of uh, white colonialism and so on and so on, but, uh, but tensions are terrifying. And here I was pleading for not abolishing borders and so on, but this type of, I don't know how to put it, global change, cooperation, like, again, the example of Congo that I uh, uh, mentioned, or like the, the, uh, forget that killing of that guy Khashoggi, it's horrible, but the true nightmare is Yemen today. What, I mean, you said somewhere that we should well think without engaging in large-scale reform, what the consequences will be. If you, okay, very briefly, I agree with you that the gap of standard Marxism was that the proletarian revolution will be a place where you do something and you know exactly what you do. If there is a lesson of the 20th century, is that this tragic logic, you want something maybe good, the result is catastrophic, holds absolutely also for revolutions and so on and so on. But, uh, uh, but uh, like, uh, in spite of all this, and I don't know what forum will it have, I'm not pleading for a new Leninist party or whatever, I'm just pleading for new forms of international cooperation and so on. I agree with you when you said the majority of us is not even really aware of the seriousness of, especially the poor, of ecological problems and so on. And I think, would you agree that the situation is here much more subtle and obscene? Uh, we, it's that logic that in psychoanalysis is called disavowal, verleugnung. In French, je sais bien, je sais bien, mais quand même. We know ecological problems, but we don't really take them seriously. And here I see problems, and I don't see an easy way out.
I, I am a pessimist, if you ask me. When people say, no, but the, they are growing, protests are growing, and so on and so on. Yes, I'm listening to this story from when I was young, you know. They are growing, and then look what happened. The mega tragedy is for me, for example, what happened to Syriza. They were elected for change, whatever, and they become, and I'm not blaming them, they become the perfect executors of... Uh, of austerity program. So I just see problems. I'm a pessimist. And I'm not a radical pessimist. But you have to, maybe here we are different. I noticed with your final speech, that final moment of your intervention, that it's very strange because usually Marxists have this stupid optimist anthropology. Just get rid of capitalist terror and we will all be happy. My God, I'm much more a pessimist. I, I don't believe in human goodness. I be, never underestimate uh, uh, evil, never est, underestimate envy. I mean, it's part of my nature. In Slovenia, we have a wonderful uh, story. Uh, a godlike figure comes to a farmer, and I will stop immediately, and asks, and, and asks him, I will do to you, to you whatever you want, just, I warn you, I will do twice the same to your neighbor. You know what Slovene farmer answers? Fine, take one of my eyes. You know. We are in this. Don't underestimate this. I don't see any simple, clear way out. Thank you. Thank you both very much. It's pretty clear, I think, to all of us that you both have quite a bit to say to each other. And so, and to ourselves. And, <laughs> and, and so I think before we, we jump to some audience questions, I thought it would be nice to give each of you a chance to ask uh, a response or ask a question or two from each other. So starting with you, Dr. Peterson. Maybe you want simply to counterattack. It wasn't fair to, well, I've only to do your reply. I, I had three questions and okay. two of them are now completely irrelevant and so um, I have one left I guess and I'm, I'm not sure that it's a fair question but maybe it's yeah. it seems to me to be a fair question okay. you're a you're a strange Marxist to have a discussion with and well but here's why this is not an insult by any stretch of the imagination I mean one of the things that struck me when I was looking at your work was that you're, well, first of all, you're a character, you know, and that's an, that's, that's an interesting thing. Like you're, Is this an insult or not? It's not an insult. <laughs> it's, a sign of, it's a sign of originality, and, and it's a sign of a certain amount of moral courage, and, and, and it's a sign of a certain temperament, and it makes you humorous and charismatic and attractive, and... Um, and, and, and I think you appeal to young people the way that outside intellectual rebels appeal to young people. And so those are all positive things that can be used positively or negatively. And my question is, like, it seems to me that your, your, um, your reputation, unless I'm very misinformed about this, is as a strong supporter of Marxist doctrines on the left, or was that? And so then, my question is, given the originality of your thought, why, why is it that you came to presume at some point in your life, perhaps not now and perhaps still, that the promotion of Marxism, rather say, rather than Zizekism, was appropriate? Because it seems to me that there's enough originality in your body of thought and lateral thinking in the manner in which you approach intellectual ideas that there's just no reason for you to be allied with a doctrine that's 170 years old and that is, if capitalism is rife with problems, is twice as rife as pro with problems as that. And so you're kind of a mystery to me in that way. And so that's my question. Okay. Right, right, right. Uh, very briefly, I, uh, I developed systematically in my book critical insights into many traditional Marxist theses, so no doubt here. You know what? I, 
still admire nonetheless in Marx, not those simplicities of communist manifesto, but I still think that his so-called critique of political economy, capital, and so on, is a tremendous achievement as a description of the dynamics of capitalist society. And if you read it closely, Marx is much more ambiguous and open there. For example, he mentions, for example, apropos what you refer to, he mentions that law of diminishing return, like why, why crisis will arrive necessarily, poor are getting poorer. But then he is honest enough to enumerate seven or eight counter tendencies. And if you read him closely, you will see that uh, precisely those tendencies prevailed later. Or uh, forget Communist Manifesto, go to read his political analysis uh, of its unsurpassable 18 Brimaire and so on of the 1848 revolution, which are incredibly complex, no traces of, traces of that class binary there. there. Uh, 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 Marx deals with middle classes with crucial, lumpen proletariat with the ambiguous role of intellectuals and so on and so on. But basically what I was pleading for, and I like to put it in paradoxical term, was for a return of, from Marx back to Hegel. I define myself more as a Hegelian. Why? Hegel is considered... Hegel is considered a madman, you know, the guy, absolute knowing, and so on and so on. No, Hegel is much more modest and open. The danger in Marxism is, for me, this teleological structure. We are at the zero point, but there is a unique chance of a reversal into a new emancipated society and so on. And the danger here is that of self-instrumentalization. Proletarian Communist Party is a, an agent of history which knows the laws of history to put it, follows them, and so on. That's the catastrophe. In Hegel, such a position is strictly prohibited. In Hegel, whenever you act, you err. So, uh, you know, you have to, there is no position of this pure acting where you know what you are doing and the result will be, will be. so I, this, this, would be, uh, this would be my main point. So yes, my, my, uh, my formula is kind of, uh, ironically, I know Hegel is the greatest idealist, uh, materialist reversal of Marx by turning back to Hegel. For Hegel, Hegel says in a part that people don't read introduction to, uh, uh, forward, sorry, to philosophy of right, he says explicitly that uh, uh, the all of Minerva takes off in the evening when there is dusk, so philosophy can just grasp a social order when it's already in its decay. Philosophy cannot see into the future. It's radical openness. We need this openness today. The tragedy today, maybe we agree here, is that we really don't have a basic, how should I call it, uh, cognitive mapping. I don't think we have here a clear insight into where we stand, where we are moving, and so on and so on. So I'm much more, again, sincerely of a pessimist. Uh, can I ask you now a question? Let me, oh, let, let let me reply, respond, yes, and, then, yes, and yes. then you can ask me a yes, question. Of course. So, Sorry. Um, well, I don't have anything to quibble about with what you just said. Um, well, no, there's not even a but, really. It's that the, even if, the, if what you said about Marx's more sophisticated thought is true, I think the unfortunate reality is that any support for Marxism, especially directed towards those are, who, who are young, is likely to be read as support for the most radical and revolutionary proclivities. And I would say that as they're outlined in the, in the document that I described, yeah. um, in the Communist Manifesto, that they're of extraordinary danger. And so it seems to me that by attempting to, you know, rescue the sheep, you've in, 
you've sort of invited the dragon into the house. And that seems to me to be dangerous and unfortunate. Here I can answer you by asking you my question. Because, uh, you know, uh, very naively, uh, you mentioned, Mark, first, do you really, where did you find the data that I simply don't see it? Okay, let me begin by this. You designate your, under quotation marks, I'm not characterizing here, enemy or what you are fighting against as sometimes you call it uh, postmodern neo-Marxism. I know what you mean, all this, from political correctness yes. to these excesses of whatever uh, uh, spirit of envy and so on and so on. Do you think they are really, where did you find this data? I don't know them. I would ask you here, give me some names or whatever. Where are the Marxists here? I don't know any. I don't, who, who is the Marxist here? Uh, show me any big names of political correctness. I think they, they fear like a good vampire fears garlic. Any, this is why they are already the one who is not a Marxist, but at least approaches economic topic, Bernie Sanders. He is already under attack as white male and all that stuff and so on. I simply, I simply, uh, my problem would be with this one. What you describe as postmodern neo-Marxism, where is really the Marxist element in it? They are for equality. Sorry, where? They are for equality at these cultural st struggles, uh, proper names, how do we call each other? Do you see in them, in political correctness and so on, any genuine will of to change society? I don't see it. I think it's a hypermoralization hypermoralization, which is a silent admission of a defeat. That's my problem. Why do you call, give me, no, it's, again, it's not a rhetorical question for politely saying you are an idiot, you don't know what you are talking about. It's simply, I would like to know, because you, and I like this often, when you attack somebody, you said aggressively, and what should, read more. Tell me whom. So I'm asking you now, not read more, I don't advise you, but who are, give me some names and so on, and who are these postmodern egalitarian neo-Marxists, and where do you see any kind even of, of Marxism? I see in it mostly an, an impotent, an utterly impotent moralization. Please, I'm well, so okay. sorry that that was too No, no, that's, that's no long. problem. Please. Well, I mean, um, organization like Jonathan Haidt's, um, uh, what's it called? Heterodox. Heterodox Academy and other organizations like that have documented an absolute dearth of conservative voices in the social sciences and the humanities, and about 25%, according to the, uh, what I think are reliable surveys, approximately 25% of social scientists in the U.S. identify themselves as Marxists. And so there's that. But where are the well, results? Okay, but, but let, can well, you name me one? Uh, the, I know a couple of Marxists. For example, uh, uh, who does very solid economic work. Yeah, well, I don't totally... Uh, David Harvey. One. But he writes very serious books of economic analysis and so on and so on. Then there is the old guy who is far from simplification, Frederick Jameson and so on. But they are totally marginalized today. In this politically correct mainstream, you know, I, I don't see. Well, yeah, your question seemed to me to focus more on the, per the peculiar relationship that I've noticed and that people have disputed between postmodernism and, and neo-Marxism, and I see the connection between the postmodernist types and the Marxists as a sleight of hand that replaced the notion of the oppression of the proletariat by the bourgeoisie as the oppression by one identity group by another. Totally and, agree with okay, you. Okay, so, but that, but, so, now look. We, we could but have that's a, precisely could, a, a non a, a non Marxist gesture, par well, excellence. Well, that that's the, see. That, I guess that's where we might have a dispute because I think what happened, especially in France in the 1960s, is as the as the radical Marxist postmodern types like Derrida and Foucault realized that they were losing the moral battle, especially after the information came out of the Soviet Union in the manner that it came out 
that, that so the whole, and so on, yeah, right? that the whole bloody Stalinist, yeah, the whole Stalinist catastrophe, along with the entire Maoist catastrophe, that they didn't really have a leg to stand on. And instead of revising their notion that human history, and this is a Marxist notion, should be regarded as uh, the eternal class struggle between the economically deprived and the oppressors, they just recast it and said, well, it, it's not based on economics, it's based on identity, but it's still fundamentally oppressor against oppressed. And to me, that meant that they smuggled the, the, the fundamental narrative of Marxism and many of its goals back into the argument without ever admitting that they did so. Now, I've been criticized, you know, for this supposition because people who are postmodernists say, look, one of the hallmarks of postmodernism is skepticism of meta narratives. It's like, yeah. I know that perfectly well. And I also know that Marxism is a meta narrative. And so you shouldn't be able to be a postmodernist and a Marxist. But I still see the union of those two things in the insistence that the best, the appropriate way to look at the view world is to view it as the battleground between groups defined by a particular. Uh, group ident between individuals defined by a particular group identity so that the group identity becomes paramount and then the proper reading is always oppressor versus oppressed with a secondary insistence that's very similar to Marx's insistence upon the um, moral superiority of the proletariat that the oppressors are by definition because they're oppressed morally superior and and there's the call for perhaps not revolutionary change, although that comes up above, but change in the structure so that that oppression disappears, so that a certain form of equality comes about. Now, you argued that Marx wasn't a believer in equality of outcome, and I'm not so sure about that, because his notion of the eventual utopia that would constitute genuine communism was a place where all class divisions were eradicated. But and so there's at least... Well, well, there's at least an implication know, okay. that the most important of the hierarchies had disappeared. And so maybe he had enough sophistication to talk about other forms of hierarchies, but if, if that's the case, then I can't imagine why he thought that the utopia that would emerge as a consequence of the elimination of economic hierarchies would be a utopia. Because if there were other forms of hierarchies that still existed, people would be just as contentious about them as they are now. Like we have hierarchies of attractiveness, for example, that have nothing to do with economics or very little to do with economics, and there's no shortage of contention around that or any other form of ability. And so that's why I associate the social justice types who are basically postmodernist with Marx, post they're postmodernist with Marxism. It's the insistence that you view the world through the narrative of oppressed versus oppressor. And I think it's a catastrophe. I think it's a catastrophe. And you appear to think no, that uh, it's a uh, catastrophe sorry, as uh, well. Uh, just one sentence and then he, you can reply. It's so strange that you mention, for example, somebody like Foucault, who, uh, for me, uh, his, do, are you aware that his main target was Marxism? Okay, for him represented in... in uh, he, and his... His game was never a radical change, but, and this is what I don't like in this, what you call postmodern, let's not call them Marxists, but revolutionaries. It's this, enjoying your own self-marginalization. The good thing is to be on the margin, you know, like not in the center and so on and so on. It almost made me nostalgic for uh, old communists who at least had the honesty to say, no, we don't enjoy our marginal position. We want to do something central power. I find so disgusting. It's no, it's no wonder you don't get invited to lots of places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you, you, you know, you know uh, Foucault for me embodies this logic of revolution, and by revolution he meant any social change series, that small resistances and so on, small marginal places of resistance and so on and so on. So, okay, but let's uh, maybe drop it here if you want, but since you are replying my question, you should have 
the last word here. No, that, I'll stop with that. Let's move to the next. We'll okay. get back to these topics, no doubt, as we move forward with the question. So I'm happy to let that, that particular issue stop. stop Did there. you already do your Stalinist manipulation and censored the questions <laughs> and how? Because this program that she described to us through some screens, questions, and so on, I think it puts him to the one who decides which questions are, as Stalinist what you put in, are the real voice of the people. Yes, so yes. <laughs> well, hopefully we can trust him. Yeah. Let's move on from that. Um, <laughs> uh, at heart this evening, uh, we're talking about happiness. At least that's the frame of the debate that we have tonight. And you've both been, in your work and also tonight, very critical of happiness as mere hedonism, pleasure-seeking, or even simply as a feeling. What does true or deeper human happiness consist of, and how is it attained? You? I don't care. Well, I don't, I don't, first of all, there's something you said five minutes ago or so. I think you were still at the podium that I agree with profoundly, which is that happiness is a side effect. It's, it's, not, it's not a thing in itself. It's something that comes upon you. It, it's like an act of grace in some sense. And my sense I is that... I accept even the theological undertone of what okay, you said. Okay, no, okay. no, the category of grace can be used in a perfect atheist sense. It's one yes. of the deepest categories. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, good. Well, I, I, would think, I would think that we could find agreement about that because partly because of your psychoanalytic background you know perfectly well that we're subject to forces within us that aren't of our voluntary control and certainly happiness is one of those because you cannot will yourself to be happy you might be able to will yourself to be unhappy but you can't will yourself to be happy there are certain preconditions that have to be met that are quite mysterious in order for you to be happy and then it happens and then maybe if you're wise you, you regard that as, as a, like an in, a minor incomprehensible miracle that somehow you happen to be in the right place at the right time. Now, I've made the case that the most effective means of pursuing the good life, which is not the same as pursuing happiness, is to adopt something like a stance of maximal responsibility towards the suffering and malevolence in the world. And I think that that should be pursued primarily as an individual responsibility. It's not like I don't think that political and familial larger organizations are necessary, but in the final analysis, we each suffer alone in some fundamental sense, and we have our own malevolence to contend with in some fundamental sense, and the proper beginning of moral behavior, which is the proper beginning of the right way to act in the world, is to take responsibility for that. I think you do what you can to conceptualize the highest good that you can conceptualize. That's the first thing, to develop a vision of what might be. And it has to be a personalized vision as well as a universalized vision. And then you work diligently to ensure that your actions are in keeping with that. And you allow yourself on that pursuit to be informed by the knowledge of your ignorance and the necessity for acting and speaking in truth. And a fair bit of that, I believe, is derived. I think it's fair to say that that's derived from an underlying Judeo-Christian ethic. And I make no bones about the fact that I think of those stories um, metaphysically or phil philosophically or psychologically as fundamental to the proper functioning of our society insofar as it can function properly. And so it's not happiness, it's meaning. And meaning is to be found in the adoption of responsibility. And then I'll close with this. Responsibility is not only to do what you believe to be right. That's not, because that's duty. That, that's not enough. That's sort of what the conservatives put forward as the ultimate virtue, which is duty. It's not that. It's, it's that you're, you're acting in a manner that is in accordance with what you believe to be right, but you're doing it in a manner that simultaneously expands your ability to do it, which means that you cannot stay safely ensconced within the confines of your current ethical beliefs. You have to stand on the edge of what you know and encounter continually the consequences of your ignorance to expand your domain of knowledge and ability so that you're not only acting in an efficient manner, but you're increasing the efficiency and productivity and meaningfulness of what it is that you're 
engaged in. And I think that, and I believe that the psychological evidence supports this, even the neuropsychological evidence, is that that's when true happiness descends upon you. Because it's an indication from the deepest recesses of your psyche, biologically instantiated, that you're in the right place at the right time. You're doing what you should be doing, but you're doing it in a manner that expands your capacity to do even better things in the future. And, and that's, I think that's the deepest human instinct there is. It's not rational. It's far deeper than that. And it's something, that, it's something that's genuine and that exists within us and that constitutes a proper guide if you don't pervert it with self-deception and deceit. So that's my perspective. Yeah, okay. I'll try, if you are stupid enough to believe me, to be brief. <laughs> uh, uh, first, I like very much what you uh, began with, this uh, uh, grace, or whatever we call it, moment of happiness. Uh, and uh, I would like to, would you agree that the same goes for love, I think. We have in English, and they have it in French, I don't know if in other languages they have it, we use the, the verb to fall in love, which means it's in this sense, in some sense, uh, a fall. You are surprised, you are shocked. Authentic love, I think, is something very traumatic even in this sense. I always like to use this example. Let's say you live a stupidly happy life. Maybe one night stand here and there, you drink with friends, then you fall in love passionately. This is, in some sense, a catastrophe for your life. All the balance is lost yes. and so on, yes. you know. Yes. Uh, so, uh, uh, That's why Cupid has arrows. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. right, yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. So, uh, but uh, uh, where I first, second, surprisingly maybe for you, I agree with your point about Judeo-Christian legacy, for which I am very much attacked, oh, Eurocentrist, and so on, and so on. Uh, you know, uh, I wonder if you would agree with it. I will try to condense it very much. You know what's for me the deepest, I simplify to the utmost, something unheard of, and I as an atheist accept the spiritual value of it, happens in Christianity. In other religions you have got up there, we fall from God, and then we try to climb back through spiritual discipline, whatever, uh, training, good deeds, and so on and so on. The formula of Christianity is a totally different one. As we philosophers would have put it, uh, you don't climb to God. God, you are free in a Christian sense when you discover that. The distance that separates you from God is inscribed into God himself. That's why I agree with those intelligent theologists, like my favorite, Gilbert Keith Chesterton, who said that this, the cross, the crucifixion, is something absolutely unique because in that moment of Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabbath, God, uh, Father, why have you abandoned me? For a brief moment, symbolically, God himself becomes an atheist, in the sense of, you know, you get a gap there. And that is something so absolutely unique. It means that you are not simply separated from God. Your separation from God is part of divinity itself. And we can then put it also in other terms, maybe closer to you, like that. Uh, that's why for me, Happiness is not some blissful unity with highest value. It's the very struggle, the fall, and so on. And that's why I hope we both worry about what will this possibility of so-called, I'm horrified with it, what Ray Kurzweil calls singularity and this blissful state. I prefer not to know, but, but the final point, very brief. Uh, uh, what I only uh, don't quite get, why... Do you put so much access to this? We have to begin with a person, with personal change. I mean, this is also the second or which one, I don't remember, forgive me, of your slogans in your book. You know, first set your house in order, then. But I have an extremely common sense naive question here. But what if in trying to set your house in order, you discover that? 
Your house in, is in this order precisely because the way the society is messed up, which doesn't mean, okay, let's forget about my house. But you can do both at the same time, and I would even say, I will give you now the ultimate example, yourself. Isn't it that you are so socially active? Because you realize that. It's not enough to tell to your, to your, uh, to your patients, set your house in order. Much of the reason of why they are in disorder, their house, is that. There is some crisis in our society and so on and so on. So my uh, reproach to you, benevolent, would have been, you know, the joke, tea or coffee, yes, please. Like, individual or social, yes, please, because this is obvious in extreme situation. Like, I hope we agree to say to somebody in, in North Korea, set your house in order. No? Ha, ha. <laughs> but I think in some deeper sense, it goes also for our societies. I'm just repeating what you are telling. You see some kind of a social crisis, and I don't see clearly why insist so much on this choice. Because, uh, let's, sorry, just to finish, I will give you an example that I, I think perfectly does it. How do we usually deal with ecology, by this false personalization, you know. They tell you, ah, what did you do? Did you put all the Coke cans on the side? Did you recycle all paper and so? Yes, we should do this. But, you know, like, uh, I, in a way, this is also a very easy way to discharge yourself, as, like, uh, you say, okay, I do the recycling, so up, you know, I did my duty, let's go on. So I would just say, why the choice there? Okay, so, well, so first of all, I have to point out that it's, you have unfairly tasked me with three very difficult questions. And so I'm, I'm hoping that I can... That's life, that's life. <laughs> As you said, life is a challenge. Yes, and so, so, so... So I'm going to, I'm hoping that I have the mental wherewithal to keep them in track and answer them in order, but you can help me if I stray. I was very interested in your comments about the, about um, Christ's atheism on, on the cross, that final moment of atheism. That, that, that's something I'd, I'd never thought about in that way. Chesterton did? Yeah. Chesterton orthodoxy. Mm. Mm, no. book, excellent. No, no, it's a, it's a very, it's a very interesting mm. thought because what it, what it, it's a really, it's an unbelievably merciful idea in some sense. Yeah. That the burden of life is so unbearable. You, and you see in the Christian passion, of course, torture, unfair judgment by society, betrayal by friends, and then, and then a, 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 a low death. And so that's, that's kind of... That's about as bad as it gets, right? Which is why it's an archetypal story, right? It's, it's about as bad as it gets. And the story that you describe points out that it's so bad that even God himself might despair about the essential quality of being. Yeah. Right, right. So, and so that is merciful in some sense because it does say that there is something that's built into the fabric of existence that tests us so severely in our faith about being itself that even God himself falls prey to the temptation to doubt. And so that's... Okay, now... This is where things get very complicated because I, I want to use that in part to answer the other questions that you answered. Look, there's, there's a very large clinical literature that suggests that if you want to develop optimal resilience, what you do is you lay out a pathway towards somewhere better Someone comes in, they have a problem, you try to figure out what the problem is, and then you try to figure out what might constitute a solution. And so you have something approximating a map, right? And it's a, it's a tentative map of how to get from where things aren't so good to where they're better. And then you, you have the person go out in the world and confront those things that they're avoiding, that are stopping them from moving towards that higher place. And there's an archetypal reality to that. It's you're in a fallen state, you're attempting to redeem yourself, and there's a process by which that has to occur. And that process involves voluntary confrontation with what you're afraid of, disgusted by, and inclined to avoid. 
And that works. Every psychological school agrees upon that, is that exposure therapy, the psychoanalysts expose you to the tragedies of your past, you know, and, and redeem you in that manner. And the behaviorists expose you to the terrors of the present and redeem you in that manner. But there's a broad agreement across psychological schools that that's, that works. And my sense is that we're called upon as individuals precisely to do that in our life, is that we are faced by this unbearable reality that you made reference to when you talked about the situation on the cross, is that life itself is fundamentally, and this is a pessimism that we might share, is fundamentally suffering and malevolence. But, and this is I think where we differ, I believe that the evidence suggests that the, the the light that you discover in your life is proportionate to the amount of the darkness that you're willing to forthrightly confront, and that there's no necessary upper limit to that. So I think that the good that people are capable of is actually, it's a higher good than the evil that people are capable of. And believe me, I do not say that lightly, given what I know about the evil that people are capable of. And I, and I think that, I believe that the central psychological message of the biblical corpus, fundamentally, is that. That's why it, it culminates, in some sense, with the idea that it's necessary to adopt, it's, it, it's necessary to confront the devil and to accept your, what would you say, your, the unjustness of your tortured mortality. If you can do that, and, that, and that's a, it's a challenge, as you just pointed out, that, that's sufficient to challenge even God himself, that you have, the, you have the best chance of transcending it and living the kind of life that will set your house in order and everyone's house in order at the same time. And so I think that's even true in states like North Korea. And like, I'm not asking people to foolishly immolate themselves for pointless reasons, you know, if I'm a, when I'm working with people who are clini clinically and they have a terrible oppressor who's their boss at work, I don't suggest that they march in and tell them exactly what they think of them and end up on the street. Mm. It's not helpful, you know. And so the pathway towards adopting individual responsibility happens to be a very individual one. But I do believe that the best bet for most people is to solve the problems that beset them in their own lives, the ethical problems that beset them, that they know are problems, and that they can set themselves together well enough so that they can then become capable of addressing larger scale problems without falling prey to some of the errors that characterize, let's say, over-optimistic and intellectually arrogant ideologues. I'll close well. Yeah, but very briefly. Let me close with one thing. One of my favorite quotes from Carl Jung, it's actually a quote that I used at the beginning of my first book, which was called Maps of Meaning, was that if you take a personal problem seriously enough, you will simultaneously solve a social problem. And, and this bears on, on your point, because it's not like your small family, even the relationship between you and your wife, is immune in some sense to the broader social problems around you. And so let's say right now there's tremendous tension between men and women in the West, and, and that's certainly the case given the divorce rate, let's say, that would be some evidence. Um, and the later and later sta ages that people are waiting to become, in, uh, to, to, to you know, enter into permanent relationships. There's a, there's a real tension there. And then if you do establish a relationship with a woman or, or a partner, but we'll say a woman in this particular case, um, you are instantly faced with all of the sociological problems in a microcosm in that relationship. And then if you work those damn problems out, if you can work them out within your relationship, then you can get some insight. It's not complete insight, but you can get some partial insight into what the problem actually is and get the diagnosis right, and you've moved some small measure forward in addressing what might constitute the broader social concern. And, what's even better, you're punished for your own goddamn mistakes. And that's another thing I like about the idea of, of working locally, is that, you know, if I do broad-scale social experiments and they fail, it's like, well, tough luck for the people for whom they failed. But if I'm experimenting on myself within the confines of my own relationship and I make a mistake, I'm going to feel the pain. And, then I, and that's good, that's just, but it also gives me the possibility of learning. And so I believe that you do 
solve what you can about yourself first before you can set your family straight and before you should dare to try to set the world straight. Otherwise, you degenerate into this kind of, you already talked about it, this shallow moralizing, this, well, I've divided my goddamn Coke cans up, and now I can spend more money on new packaging at the supermarket, which is exactly what the psychological research indicates that people do if they perform a casual moral uh, action. They immediately justify committing a less moral action because they've put themselves in a higher moral place. And you might, if you were a real pessimist, you'd say, well, that's why they performed the action to begin with. I think that's often true. That's associated with that shallow moralizing. Are we, are we too much in this direction? Or, or I, I, again, I will put in my Stalinist terms, uh, would you go as far as to say, who needs the people? We talk for the people, and we know better than the people. No, because I don't want to take too much of the time for uh, the public, but you know what interests me? Would you then agree, because this is how Hegel reads the story of the fall, that fall really is Felix culpa in the sense that for Hegel, before the fall, we are simply animals. It's through the fall that you perceive goodness as what will drag you out of the fall. So, in this sense, fall is constitutive of the very, you know, it's not you fall from goodness. You fall, and that's the dialectical paradox. Your fall retroactively creates what you fell from, as it were. And that's the tough lesson for cheap moralists to, uh, uh, to uh, to accept. But uh, you know where I see, very briefly, maybe a counter question. What fascinates me, we didn't cover this, I didn't cover this, but speaking about ideology, would you agree? What fascinates me more and more is uh, not big ideology in the sense of projects and so on. In our cynical era, uh, people claim, oh, we no longer take them seriously and so on. But and here, for me, social dimensions enter, enters even our intimate space. Implicit beliefs, ideological presuppositions, why not, which we embody in our most common daily practices. For example, probably some of you already know it, I will nonetheless repeat a very shortened version. I was occupied at some point by the structure of toilets in Western Europe. I noticed this speci yeah, yeah, specificity of German toilets, where, you know, the shit doesn't, dis shit doesn't disappear in water, it is there exposed so that you smell it and control it for whatever, and I immediately associated it with German spirit of poetry and reflection and so on. It's a bad joke, but what I'm saying is that in a sense, and I've spoken with some specialists, I was so intrigued by uh, of, uh, how do you construct toilets, and they admitted it, there is no direct, uh, direct utilitarian reason. It is as if, even in something as vulgar as going to the toilet, ideology in this deeper sense is there. Another thing that, at the same level, I repeat one of my old jokes, that fascinates me intensely is how it's not just as superficial psychoanalysts claim, we pretend to be moral to believe, but deeply we are cynical egotists. Quite often in today's times, we think that we are free, permissive, and so on, but secretly we are dominated by an entire pathological, or not even often pathological, structure of prohibitions and so on. So we may, and this is what interests me so much, precisely in today's time where, we, and this is how would you agree, we would explain these simple facts which may appear weird, that how apparently they, so they tell us we live in permissive times take your pleasure, make, enjoy it. But at the same time, there is probably, so some clinicians are telling me, more frigidity and impotence than ever. Yes. That's the lesson of psychoanalysis, I hope we agree, is not this vulgar one. 
you are cannot perform sexually, you go to a, psychology, a psychiatrist, he teaches you how to get rid of authority and so on. It's a much more complex situation. It's, uh, and this is what interests me immensely. All this set of implicit beliefs, how you don't even know, but you, you know, I will repeat the story that half of you know and you, my favorite that Niels Bohr anecdote. You know, he had a house outside Copenhagen, the quantum physics guy, and he had a horseshoe, a superstitious, uh, above his door, yes, and then a friend asked him, but do you believe in it? Why do you have it there? And he said, of course not, I'm a scientist. Why then do you have it there? Because I was told it works. The idea is it prevents evil spirits I, uh, to enter the house. It works even if you don't believe in it. Yeah, yeah. Ne? That's ideology today. That's ideology today. It's fundamental. Okay. So, so, so. Um. I want to solicit from you to tell a joke. Don't you see this? I think that people. <laughs> I think, I think that people are, are possessed by ideas that aren't theirs, they're, yeah. and their personalities yeah. that aren't theirs, and that's the great psychoanalytic insight. It's yeah. not ideas, it's personalities. It's way worse than, than ideas. And some of those personalities might be the ones that are associated with the idea that freedom is found in maximizing hedonistic moment-to-moment -moment pleasure or something like that, which, nice which sounds me, yeah. like freedom. Like for me, I, one of the things that I suggest to people is that they watch themselves as if they do not understand who they are or what they're ruled by. And then notice those times when they're, they're, they're where they should be. That, and that's back to our discussion about meaning rather than happiness. It's like you'll see there are times that in your life where you're somewhere or you've done something and all of a sudden you're, you're together. You're, you're where you should be. Your conscience is not disturbing you. You're, you're, you're not proud of what you did, because pride is the wrong term, but you understand deeply that you've done something that you should have done. You might not understand why, you might not even understand what it is, but the study of that can help elucidate the difference between what actually constitutes you, which is a very difficult thing to discover, and what constitutes the accretion that characterizes you because of the, well, let's say your intense, your intense proclivity for socialized mimicry. And so, you know, you're, I don't mean you personally, but people are amalgams of everything they've seen and everything they've, this every person me. they've watched. This is yeah, me. Yes, this is yes, me. and everything they've read. And, and to integrate that and to find the, 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 the truth that constitutes that integration is an incredibly difficult endeavor. And one of the reasons why in 12 Rules for Life, for example, I suggested that people try to tell the truth or at least don't lie is because one of the ways, apart from pursuing what, you, what appears to you to be meaningful, one of the ways of escaping from that possession by the kind of ideology that you're describing, which is like an, it's like a it's like an unconscious of unidentified axioms. It's something like yeah, that, yeah. even though they take personified form, they're like personalities, is to stop saying things you know not to be true. It's a nice pathway forward. It's, the original rule was tell the truth, and I thought, no, that's not any good, because you're so biased and limited and ignorant and possessed that you don't know what the truth is, and so you can't be asked to tell it. But everyone does have the experience of being about to say or do something that they know by their own they know as deeply as they can know anything about themselves that that utterance or action is wrong and they still do it now my suggestion is try to stop doing that and one of the consequences, well, you can try in small ways, like you might not be able to manage it in big ways, but now and then, you know, you're tempted to do something that you know to be wrong, and you could not do it. And if you practice that, you get better and better at not doing it, and that means you lie less, and you, and you take the easy route out less, and you pursue 
hedonic pleasures that cost you in the future less, you start to straighten yourself out. You take the beam out of your eye. That's essentially what you're doing. And over time, you have some modicum of hope that your vision will clear up and you'll be able to see the proper pathway forward. And that's part of the process of redemption. And it seems to me to be in your grasp, you're capable of doing that, you have a conscience, it does inform you from time to time correctly about the difference between good and evil, the, the consequence, the knowledge, the consequence of the fall that you described, which I think you described in very eloquent terms, and that you can slowly make your way back to the straight and narrow path that's characterized by maximal meaning, but also, see that this instinct of meaning is a sophisticated one, it's not that I'm making a case for the individual, like Ayn Rand makes a case for the individual. That's not it. I'm making a case for individual responsibility. That's not the same thing. It's like, there is something that's good for you, but it has to also be good for your family. If it's just good for you, that's not good enough. And if it's good for you and your family, and it's not good for society, then that's not good enough either. And so the responsibility is to find a pathway that balances these things in a harmonious manner. It's like a, I got a lot of this thinking from Jean Piaget and his idea of equilibrated states, right? Is you're, you're attempting to find something like a game that everyone is willing to play that can be played in an iterative manner and not degenerate. Well, hopefully actually ascend, if that's possible. Hopefully become a better and better game across time. And I do believe that, I do believe that you can do that. I do believe that you can do that if you're guided by truth, and I do believe that the pathway to that is the phenomenology of meaning. And then the secondary consequence of that is, if you do that, now and then you might be happy. And then you should be profoundly grateful, because happiness, as we already agreed upon, is something like a grace. Just what basically... Uh, sorry. <laughs> Again, my pessimism comes here. I agree with you, but the danger here, here ideology can massively enter. You describe a nice situation. You are tempted or ordered or whatever to do something that you know it's wrong. But so-called totalitarian ideologies step in at this point and try to present to you that the true greatness is to do what you individually think is wrong for the higher cause. You know who says this wonderfully? Uh, uh, a horrible guy. Uh, 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 Heinrich Himmler of SS. No, no, no. Sorry, seriously. He, he, he knew the problem. German officers must do horrible things. Yes. Kill Jewish, and his solution was double. First, to let them know, as he put it somewhere, every idiot, idiot, okay, ordinary man, can do something great, maybe, not all, sacrifice himself for his country. But his reply was, his point was, but it takes a truly great man to be ready to lose his soul and to do horrible things for his country. Yeah. And I read some good memoirs of relatively honest communists who broke down when they were sent to the countryside famine in early 30s. And this is what, this is what they were told by Aparatchik. You will see horrible things, children starving and so on. Remember there is the higher cause and your highest ethical duty is to, is to overcome this small bourgeois sentimentality. And so here I see the danger of, again my pessimism, false meaning, which can massively cover this false narrative. Second thing, also the solution by, I wonder if you share this pessimism of mine, another one by Himmler. You know what was his sacred book I read? He all the time had a special uh, uh, leather-bound copy in his pocket, Bhavagad Gita. He massively, he said, his problem was this one, he puts it perfectly. Uh, Nazi officers have to do SS horrible things. How to enable them to do it without themselves becoming horrible beings? His solution was oriental wisdom. 
to learn to act from distance. I am not really there. And this is, was the shock of my life. Based on this, do you know the book? I found a book, the guy then wrote many books, Brian Victoria, Zen at War. It's a shocking book, especially horrible for many so-called anti-Eurocentrists who claim our monotheism is guilty of everything, we need Oriental. Yeah, but that book is about the, apart from a couple of exceptions, the behavior of Zen Buddhist community in Japan in the 30s, early 40s, not only they totally supported Japanese expansion into, into uh, China, they even provided properly Zen Buddhist justification for it. For example, the one, you know who did this? No, you are not as old as me, I remember him. D.T. Suzuki, the great pre... Yeah, but, okay, he was doing this in the 60s, but as a younger guy, he was fully supporting Japanese militarism, and one of his justifications was this one. The advice to, of Japanese military to them to support Zen Buddhist training. Because he says, it's one of the most horrifying things that I've ever read, he said, sorry, don't take it personally, but let's say an officer orders me, if I were to tell this to you, it would be too obvious, so I pick you, I have to kill you, stab you with my knife. And he says, if I remain in this illusionary self, then I feel responsible, I kill you. But he says, if you are enlightened by Zen Buddhism, then you know there is no substantial reality. You become a neutral observer of your life, just a flow of phenomena, and you tell yourself, it's not that I am killing you, but in the cosmic dance of phenomena, my knife is floating and somehow your knife falls. You know what I'm saying? This I'm not disputing some spiritual greatness of Zen Buddhism. I'm saying how even the most enlightened uh, this spiritual experience can serve a terrible cause. Now, because we're running very quickly out of time, and it's clear that this conversation could go for a very long time, I'm going to ask one representative question here and give you each one minute each. And that is, and that is simply this. Coming from online, what is one thing you hope people will leave this debate with and why? Jordan. I, I hope they leave this debate with a belief in the power of communication between people with different views. You know, that's... And, I mean, there, 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 is this, there is a growing idea on college campuses, tell me if I go over my minute, that there really is no such thing as free speech because people are only the avatars of their group identity and they have nothing unique to say. And besides that, there's no communication across boundaries of identity or belief. And, and I think that that's an unbelievably dangerous and, and pernicious um, uh, doctrine. And I think that people of goodwill, despite their differences, can communicate and they can both come out of that communication improved, even though there might be some dissent and some, some dissent and some dissent on the way. And so that's what I would hope people would come out of Lovely. this. Thank you. I will be more concrete, even politically. There is today, so it appears, this big conflict between all that postmodern stuff that you oppose and this alt-right and so on. I hope sincerely that we made at least some people to think and to reject this simple opposition. There are quite reasonable... <laughs> the only alternative to alt-right is not uh, political correctness and so on. And I, now I'm speaking not for you, but for me. Please, if you are a leftist, don't feel obliged to be politically correct. Think, think, don't be afraid, don't be afraid to think. And uh, especially, would you agree, one great, 
version of not thinking is how immediately, if they don't agree with you, you are labeled a fascist. But that's the laziness. People find something they don't agree with instead of thinking, they think about something we all agree was a bad thing, oh, you are a fascist, and so on. You know, it's not as simple as that. Even Trump, of whom I'm deeply critical, no, I'm sorry to tell you, yes, he is a catastrophe in the long term and so on, but he is not a fascist. You make it all too easy to play these games. I just want not a positive result, but to shatter you a little bit, to, to make you think. I have always felt that the greatest conversations are unfinished ones. Please join me in thanking Slavoj Žižek and Jordan Peterson for a great unfinished conversation. Thank you, Slavoj. Can we wave to everyone? All right.